So um, we were waiting for all the members of the committee. One of the members of the committee can make it until the private defense. But we have everybody here now, and we're ready to start. Uh, so with that, I don't want to take a lot of the spotlight from Ian. Uh, just to say that we are here to celebrate his defense, his public portion of the defense. Uh, after this, for the family members, I also want everybody to welcome Ian's family here. Um, after this, we were going to the private defense part, which will take an hour and a half, two hours. So somebody will show you the coffee shop. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, so you know, I just wanted to say briefly uh, that yeah, you know, has been pretty super happy here. It seems like it was yesterday. It looks like you know, I don't know how time goes by. No matter the last few years of that, um, you know, I know that you have made a difference here. I know people love you. Uh, we love you in our group. You know, it has been good times, bad times. The pandemic hit you in the middle of your main project. We had to change projects, but you made it. Um, and also, you know, I wanted to say thank you for trying to get us to learn Julia. <laughs> <laughs> as, you can see, as you can see, the Julia colors in the title. <laughs> And, uh, and actually, you know, I'm just saying, like, Ian got a master's in computer science. Oh, no, 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 just in some classes. Just in some classes. I think I have some kind of degree in computer science together <laughs> with, you know, with the PhD. And, uh, and also, you know, I wanted to say, Ian, that the access team is not here, but I think a lot of them are online uh, because they are all over the world. And, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I, let's get going and uh, let's see how we do it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Mercedes. And sorry, transit is the mic. Alrighty. Uh, I always never know where to put these things. Okay, is that um, audio coming out okay for everybody? A little higher. Okay, I had a feeling. One more button. One more. Is that, is that, is that looks pretty high. Is that okay? Wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> cool. Come on, pockets. You can do it. That's not supposed to pop off. So leave us right here. It's fine. I'll be hanging up by my laptop anyway because I think uh, this is being recorded, so I'm just going to use my mouse as like a laser pointer. Speaking of which, can everybody see that okay? Solid. <clears throat> wow. Okay, so thank you, Mercedes, yeah, for that great intro. Whew. Sorry, I'm just going to shake it out a little bit here. So just going to do the you know, regular spiel about the first slide. So hi. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Ian all that fun stuff. And uh, today I'll be talking to you about uh, a little bit about my thesis project and what I've been working on for these past six years, which is indeed out characterizing this class of uh, exoplanet called Hot Jupiters with a survey called Access. And we'll be introducing both uh, in this presentation here. Um, but first, you know, definitely, um, I definitely have a lot of people that I want to thank. And, you know, unfortunately, I, I have more people than I want to thank than I have minutes, you know, available in this presentation. So I'm trying my best here. Uh, so I guess just right off the bat, you know, Sean, Rob, Janice, George, everybody from the CF, uh, just everybody, they've just been working in the background, making sure all of our IT computer problems just worked seamlessly. Uh, if I know, need like an Ethernet port set up in my office or to get VPN access, which, you know, is always a struggle, especially get them to the cluster, they were there for us. And they even, you know, have this live stream going on right now, uh, thanks to them. So uh, hi, YouTube. And thanks, Sean. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, next up, uh, Peg, Rob, Stephanie, Christine, Beth, just everybody in admin. Again, also people working behind the scenes to make sure things run seamlessly. Um, you know, they're involved in making sure all the funding was secured so that we could, you know, go down to the telescopes and do our observing. And I need to slow way down. I'm sorry. <sighs> they did everything from, you know, securing funding for us to, you know, go down and do observing and to, you know, uh, go and do conference travel and collaborate with uh, other people and other colleagues. And honestly, I mean, their names should all be like on my degree too. Like, I just cannot have done any of this without them. And I hope it goes without saying, Mercedes, of course, <laughs> she's been there with me, the good times and the bad, as she said. All the panicked emails, all the happy emails, Mercedes was there. <laughs> uh, and then speaking of research groups, also want to back up a step uh, and say thank you to my undergrad uh, group, the Slug Lab, or some supercomputing lab for undergraduates, back at sunny California and UC Santa Cruz. Go banana slugs. That got me just like interested in exoplanets in the first place. Uh, so I just want to say thanks to all of them. Uh, honestly, I wouldn't have been there without anybody uh, to be here today. 
Okay, so I think that's most of the academic stuff. I just got to cut myself off right there for thank yous. So um, for all the familiar faces I see in the crowd as well, I'd also like to say my thanks. Um, and I don't want to go too far over time here. I forgot to start my timer. Oh, no. And <laughs> start. So I hope it's okay if I just like to splash up a few things here. So uh, first, I guess I'm just going to go just kind of random here. The exit at BBC, <laughs> uh, Troll Cave. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> um, Terrace and uh, <laughs> Upland Ave et al. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Carson Volleyball Crew, uh, Harvard Volleyball Crew, uh, HKS Rowing, and Dudley Crew team. Um, Y'all definitely made the 6 a.m. Uh, practices worth it. And getting on that water is definitely a great sanity, a way for me to keep my sanity. So I appreciate you all for that. Uh, and then I just absolutely uh, want to give my biggest thanks to my family. I want to say, okay, I want to say thank you to, you know, uh, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents. Hi, Grandpa, if you're watching this back in Indiana. Uh, uh, thank you to, uh, you know, Monica, my little sister, Mila, and especially a big thank you to my mom and my dad here, here in the audience right now. Oh, and my brother, Jared's here, too. He's, he's all right, too, I guess. <laughs> Honestly, the... Uh, the sacrifices that y'all made so that I could have the opportunities to pursue my dreams, to get to do what I love with, you know, with the people that I love here was really, <laughs> well, don't do that. It's, it's really just all thanks to you guys. Um, so really, um, this presentation's for you. So, <laughs> so let's, let's get it going, y'all. Um, so exoplanets, right? <laughs> exoplanets. <sighs> what have I been working on? <sighs> so, I've been working on this thing called the characterization of exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, so just first off, I just wanted to give some quick motivation <laughs> behind characterization and why we're doing it now. So I just want to start by introducing the characters here. So since the discovery, oh, I hope that goes. Cool, it does. Since the first discovery of an exoplanet, you know, about 30 years ago now, um, there's just been this, okay, there's just been an absolute explosion in discoveries of these worlds formed around other stars, um, especially in the last decade with dedicated ground and space-based <laughs> campaigns. Now, even though only this sort of small, get my mouse to move over here, you can do it, mouse, this small little section, 3,000 long light year section right here has sort of been in, in mapped out, it's still in the progress of being mapped out. Uh, we still have found, you know, thousands of exoplanets so far, as shown by this little movie here um, on the right. Come on, mouse. Okay. And what these detections uh, tell us is that there's just this whole zoo of different worlds out there. Um, for example, here are the multi-planet systems discovered by the space-based uh, Kepler mission, going up to, I think, about the day before Halloween 2018, uh, compared in scale to our own solar system right there in the center. So there's just all these different architectures out there. They're different sizes, different colors. Where it's not just our own little solar system right there in the middle anymore. And honestly, this is sort of just like mesmerizing to, to just watch. But I you know gotta, gotta keep going here. So I want to keep moving along. <sighs> do, do, do. Now um, there's a variety of different methods that have been developed to find these targets, and um, we're just finding them so fast now that this figure I think is already a little bit out of date. It's just a quick dashboard you can pull up and see the current count of exoplanets that have been discovered. Um, I put this in about last week, and I think uh, today we're at around like 5,000, like 14 or so, and that's, I'm probably still behind. So this number just keeps on ticking up. Um, so we're at this point now where instead of just asking, are they out there, we can begin asking the next question of, you know, what are they like? So in this talk, I'll be focusing on the most successful method for exoplanet detection, uh, the transit method. And um, also talk about how we extend this to begin addressing the question, um, this question of what they're like. Um, via the characterization of the planet's atmospheres. Now, unfortunately, you know, we're not quite there yet where we're able to just look at these exoplanets and see something like this. Um, they're just too dim and too far away to be able to resolve a pretty picture like this. So, here we go. <laughs> so just a quick disclaimer. So uh, what we can do today, though, is study the much brighter and easier to observe stars that, they or um, stars that the planets orbit and search for the signatures that are imprinted onto them from, the planet, from the, its exoplanet. So here's a quick movie just showing how we accomplish this using the transit method. Um, you probably saw a similar uh, schematic of this in Marisa's talk yesterday. So uh, we first we start by waiting for an exoplanet to pass in front of its host star, and then we just measure the amount of light that's blacked out, and we use this as a direct observable um, that we can then use to measure the apparent size of the planet relative to its host star. Now, different sources such as molecules of water, methane, or CO2, sort of just sort of like in cartoon style, given by these different colors up here, the different um, 
uh, 1.8, 2.1, 2.3 micron, which is just a wavelength measurement of light, um, removes um, the starlight out of our line of sight. And so what that effectively does is it changes the apparent size of its planet at those particular wavelengths. And so if we just map out uh, that color of light that we're looking at as uh, versus how big the planet appears, uh, we build out something called the transmission spectrum, which you know, might look something like this. And encoded in the spectrum is detailed information um, about these different opacity sources present in the atmosphere of the exoplanet, and a whole lot more, um, as we'll get to see a little bit of later in the talk. And it's our job as astronomers to decode and interpret this signal. Alrighty. So how large are these atmospheric signals in the first place? Like, how large are these signals that we're dealing with? And what sort of information are we, you know, exactly pulling out? So I just want to start with this uh, sort of, like, simple cartoon here. Uh, I'm just going to quickly step through this here, because I'm sure you've seen it to death in other presentations. Um, but the amount of light blocked during a transit um, at a particular wavelength, we say, you know, again, is equal to this ratio of the size of the planet to its host star, which we're looking at here at sort of like an edge-on view. And so we're the observer looking at it into the screen. So um, if we then assume that there's an atmosphere H around this planet, well, first, sorry, I'm a step behind my animations here. So we're just going to start with this ratio here of the bare rock passing by its star. But then if we assume that there's a thin atmosphere on this planet with some like, height H that we call the scale height, then what we can do is we can do the same game of taking the ratio of their areas, which, by the way, is why I have this, these square terms that just dividing by two areas of a circle, and then we subtract out that increased uh, area due to having an atmosphere from that, uh, subtract the bare rock model, I should say, from that atmosphere model, then we can actually get a measurement or uh, an estimate of how large the signal should be that we would expect if there's this atmosphere present around the planet. And um, in a lot of cases, um, especially for hot Jupiters, we can also make you know, a nice simplifying assumption that the radius of this planet is a lot smaller than its star, and maybe write something like this for RP much smaller than RS squared. Um, but that's not really so important. What the cool bit about this is, is that H term right there, because encoded in that term is like a lot of good information about the atmosphere of the planet, including how hot it is, uh, what um, you know, elements or molecules might exist in its atmosphere, and also the surface gravity of the planet. So that's T, mu, and G, respectively. Do. And so that's all well and good. So we have an idea to uh, uh, set up a framework for characterizing this atmosphere using this sort of simple schematic. But again, how, how big are these signals? So for about Jupiter-sized planet, about 1,000 parts per million. So if we look at a light flicker, it's about 0.1%. And then for much smaller Earth analog planets, that can be up to 1,000 times less. And so unfortunately, you know, spoiler alert, we, can't, we don't quite have this precision just yet. Hopefully coming soon, I might talk about later. We're currently about the 1,000 ppm level, maybe like a, a factor of a couple uh, less than that. But really, because we're working with these precision levels, it's this class of large planets that orbit their stars relatively frequently that tend to be the prime targets for this sort of uh, characterization just because they tend to have the largest signals. And that class of planet that meets those uh, requirements are known as hot Jupiters. Uh, I know Jupiters because of the round of Jupiter and hot because they're close to their stars. And no, we are actually not that uh, creative, so that's just the name that we go with. You know, for, that's what astronomers come up with, but hey, it works. <sighs> so. Now we've established, OK, hot Jupiters. These are sort of like the prime targets to go after. So what can we do with that? So um, studies have actually um, already commenced uh, to try and characterize these particular class of planets already uh, in the search for sort of overarching trends in their atmospheres. So sort of like you know, overarching lessons that we can learn by looking at different populations of exoplanets. So uh, in this figure here, we have about 30 plus exoplanets uh, shown by these colored squares here whose atmospheres have um, been studied uh, in enough detail to uh, build a transmission spectrum. Uh, and so here on the x-axis, we have their equilibrium temperature, and on the y, uh, the surface gravity, just those two parameters we saw earlier. And the colors correspond to this term that we call A sub h, which um, I'll show a quick picture of over here, which is basically just a measure of how clear the atmosphere is. Uh, so just to step through this like, uh, pretty quickly, um, this is a measurement of the, transmission of the transmission spectrum in the infrared portion of the spectrum, so northward of a micron or more. And we're zooming in on this particular band here, which is an absorption feature due to water. And if we zoom in here and we measure the amplitude uh, relative to the continuum spectrum around it, that's a measure of this A sub H uh, water amplitude. And the idea is that um, the 
If there's clouds in the planet's atmosphere, that will obscure this signal and decrease the amplitude. So clearer skies will tend to have a larger water feature amplitude um, in this sort of like picture we have here. And a similar search for trends uh, with this A sub H term um, in the hot Jupiter population was also done by Peter Dow and his group. Um, and that sort of especially showed the importance of having a cloud model uh, in the first place to sort of give an idea of, the, um, of what sort of trends might be, might be hiding here. And uh, this is sort of shown by these fits that they have to their models. Again, this is the same axes we saw from before, only now we're swapping. Now we have gravity as a color and we have the water feature amplitude on the y-axis. And this dotted line right here is their model for a clear atmosphere. And the different colors correspond to different gravities. And you see that just doesn't fit the data very well. Um, but when they introduce their cloud model, we see that it actually does have um, much better agreement with the variations in this water feature amplitude as a function of the equilibrium temperature. Um, but the problem is, though, the spread in the surface gravities looks pretty random. Like, if you just look at the distribution of the colors, like, no really sort of clear trends are popping out just yet. So, more, so people look for, you know, maybe more connections with the surface gravity term to see if there might be something hiding there. So uh, actually recently, just this year, um, um, like a study to try and look for this was submitted by Diamond et al. Um, that's sort of like searching for this trend. And what they did was they um, have these sort of, as they looked at a, um, a different population of gas giants that are slightly lower mass, uh, just so it's a different population that they're looking at to do this trend analysis. And they just plotted it all against a bunch of different planetary and stellar parameters. And these three right here tended to have the strongest trends out of all the different parameters that they searched for. So they found the strongest trends between uh, this, this water feature amplitude we have on the y-axis again and the surface gravity planet on the top. It's scale height, I should be using my mouse, sorry, for the people on YouTube. Scale height down here and the planet density here on the left. Um, but even though they do see a slight trend, there's Still no strong correlation, as you can see, might be too blurry by this R, this R factor here. So a slight trend, but not a lot of correlation with those parameters. Um, now, I mentioned before that they were looking at a lower, uh, uh, a lower mass sort of class of hot Jupiter, or rather of gas giant. And the reason they're doing that is because this lower mass equivalent of, of uh, you know, gas giants um, are, are thought to have primarily hazy atmospheres. So what they did next is they introduced a haze model and, and tried this analysis again. And they found a stronger trend, not just with the surface gravity, but with the temperature of the planet as well in this, uh, in this explicit root T over G a relationship compared to the water feature amplitude. Uh, but again, still, they were still not able to find a very strong correlation uh, with those two terms, just like a sort of like a tentative trend. Uh, and, this is, and this was attributed to just not having enough points in the sample size to you know, really sort of like hammer down this correlation. Uh, so given this current sample size, again, we just don't see, see the sort of same clear trends that we do in a similar class of objects that I'd like to introduce next um, uh, very briefly, known as brown dwarfs. And uh, these are objects that bridge the gap between gas giants and stars. And the data from this community is much richer in terms of quality and quantity. Uh, and so it would be worthwhile to look to this community um, uh, when we try applying our own sort of like trend analysis to an exoplanet population, because as we'll see, of sort of some, anal some analogous uh, characteristics they have. So let me just start by just breaking down this diagram uh, just briefly. So here we have a color magnitude diagram uh, for measured brown dwarfs, uh, which is something that is much more readily observable for this you know, class of, of object in the sky. So uh, here we have its difference of brightness in two particular bands, the J and K band on the x-axis, and the J band on the sorry, mouse, and J-band on the y-axis. Uh, and, you know, astronomers, again, uh, we're not creative with naming things, and we also like doing things backwards. So its lower numbers tend to be brighter. So what that means is that things to the camera left, all right, looks bluer, and things to the right tend to look redder. And when they plot out the population of measured brown dwarfs in this scheme, they see some, you know, groupings start to pop out pretty readily. And, uh, you know, this is already nice to see, um, but, What's also, I think, also really exciting is that if you take that same plot and then you overplot these yellow circles, which are observations of those color magnitude measurements again for another class of exoplanet known as um, like these young forming hot Jupiters, which were discovered by a different detection method known as direct imaging, they tend to also slightly fall on these groupings as well, which is uh, sort of, you know, some more evidence between this brown dwarf 
in gas giant connection um, that we can try to draw from when trying making our own trends with these lower mass objects. And I'd like to sort of bring your attention to this grouping right here in particular um, that I like to focus on. Uh, so each of these letters are just sort of like the different uh, types for the brown dwarf. So here we have L-type brown dwarfs. And something that we notice is that the directly imaged gas giants um, here tend to also follow along this grouping as well, except they're all offset in the red direction. And so what that means in terms of observations is that when we look at these regularly imaged uh, gas giants that tend to have similar temperatures as these L-type brown dwarfs but lower gravities, they tend to look redder. And this has been attributed to um, clouds forming in these, uh, uh, I'm sorry, clouds forming in its atmosphere, which preferentially scatter red light, you know, back into our eyes, or into our telescopes, into our eyes, and we make these observations. So uh, in other words, uh, the thinking is that higher surface gravities are thought to correspond to clearer skies, or skies that aren't as, as, as red in the case of the L dwarfs. So this figure is encouraging because even though we do not see such sort of strong population trends in, exoplanet, in transiting exoplanet atmospheres um, just yet, this may just be due to the lack of an adequate sample size, you know, sort of like, you know, as opposed to this like large sample size that we have for brown dwarfs where we do see it, um, um, apparent trends pop out. So um, I guess, you know, I've probably hit you over the head enough with this idea by now that it seems like having additional observations um, of transmission spectra for more exoplanets, uh, spanning this parameter space in T and G especially, um, will sort of give us the necessary information for searching for these potential trends on uh, the characterizations of these planets' atmospheres. And <laughs> this slide's for David. <laughs> Not just any old transmission spectra observations, but ones uh, that span an adequate range in wavelengths uh, will be needed. So this classic figure from David Singh's group illustrates this point beautifully, I think. And David is also in the audience. Hi, David. <laughs> so no pressure there. Here we have a model transmission spectra uh, for a variety of different uh, like exoplanet um, atmosphere types with uh, clear atmospheres on the top, cloudy uh, in the middle, and, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I have it, and clear on the bottom right here. And these black lines, just that same clear curve just for comparison. And what we see is that redward of about a micron, so here in the IR, these models tend to look pretty indistinguishable from each other. Uh, it's not really until we go into the optical portion of the spectrum here that the differences in the models start to become more apparent and can start to tell them apart more. And it is actually this uh, portion of the spectrum that the survey that I've been working on for the you know, past six years actually focuses in to provide this necessary data that we need in the optical portion of the spectrum to then combine with IR data, which we can then use to sort of break this degeneracy um, between model atmospheres for exoplanets. So today, I'll be sharing uh, results with you for three new targets uh, from this survey. So, great, that popped up. The first will be WASP-43b, uh, which we were lucky enough to already have IR measurements for, uh, from Laura Greiberg and her group's uh, 2014 study of this planet. And then next, we're going to have two new entries uh, with no prior transmission spectra data op or observations to date. Uh, first will be HAT-P23b, and then WASP-50b here. And collectively, these three targets are known as high-gravity hot Jupiters uh, because of the relative, uh, at least, sort of like sparse space here that they reside in, uh, north of this uh, like roughly 20 meter per second squared, you know, surface gravity line, where the majority of these other observations of transiting uh, gas giants uh, with measured transmission spectra tend to lie below. So, all right. With the main characters now introduced, um, I'd like to briefly step through our survey's methodology to analyze each of these targets. It starts, well, with, with a telescope, a uh, really big telescope. For our survey, we use the six and a half meter Bada telescope uh, that's located at Las Campanas Observatory uh, in the southern reaches of the Atacama Desert uh, uh, in Chile. Uh, the site is home to uh, these little Pokemon known as Viscacha, which uh, like to come out and watch the sunrise. And, um, all my pictures of them were too dark and too blurry, so I'm glad I was able to find a nicer one from this kind Reddit user here uh, to include in the presentation. And uh, speaking of great pictures, uh, we also use a spectrograph aboard this telescope known as IMAX. Uh, that was a great transition, right? <laughs> and, which we operate from the control room right around the corner here. Uh, and next, uh, just, uh, just literally right next door, like the stairs are just like, right, right here off, off, the, off the screen. And, uh, we use, and we use this instrument uh, to create and measure our spectra. Now, IMAX is really, really cool. 
Uh, here's some real data collected from it from one of our targets. Uh, we're looking at a picture of the night sky um, observed by the telescope and recorded by IMAX onto its 8 CCD chip array here. Uh, which is essentially just like a scaled up version of those things you know we have in our phones for pictures or recording videos or TikToks or whatever you know the cool thing is kids do these days. And then next we just take a mask and we place it um, over our field of view to isolate our target star and other comparison stars in the field of view. And these are basically a way, these comparison stars are basically a way to help us calibrate and correct um, our observations over the course of the night. And um, we'll be seeing uh, a little bit more from them later in the presentation. Uh, so after we place this mask, we next place a dispersing element, which is essentially like those prisms you pick up from the, uh, you know, the Science Museum gift shop that split light into a rainbow. And we place it in the path of light before it falls onto our chip array. And what that does is it spreads out our light in the wavelength direction. And this builds out a spectrum measurement for our target star in each of those comparison stars. So now that we have this spectrum, um, we can start thinking about uh, what its measurements can tell us in terms of a transmission spectrum. And what I mean by that is, if I get my mouse back over here, if we, if we take a cut right here on our target star, that's essentially a single point in the light curve in a particular wavelength bin. And then if we just run this and stare at it for the, you know, the whole night, you know, maybe taking breaks to blink, which we call exposing and readout like, respectively, we build out the rest of this light curve at that particular wavelength bin. And then if we take that light and we smoosh it all back down or integrate it in the wavelength direction, uh, we build out something called a white light curve, which uh, might look something like this. Also probably seen, looks, might look familiar from, from Reese's exoplanets uh, portion of his talk. Um, and so this is sort of like a quick look, sort of like raw data of a target star divided by a comparison star, which is uh, one way that we reduce systematics uh, uh, in our observations. And that's all well and good, um, but this was a really great night. More often than night, the light curves might look um, maybe something more like, might like this, uh, or even worse. And this is due to clouds and other weather that just get in the way of our observations. And you know, this weather you know, is super fascinating on other planets, but down here it's kind of a lo logistical nightmare. So, uh, these, um, so these systematic effects um, you know, are, again, originating from the telescope itself and from our atmosphere, you know, that blanket of gas that gets in the way between us and our observations. I guess it's good for radiation protection, whatever. I guess I'll take that. So what we do to deal with this, well, is first we sort of uh, make some just like general observations. For example, we see that there's sort of like this overarching trend uh, in the baseline of the light curve, which is due from looking at different levels in its air mass. And honestly, this could be a whole talk in and of itself. So I'm just going to just keep stepping past this. And then we also see some like higher frequency wiggles um, within here. So we need a way to model these systematics, which we just collectively call noise. And so what we do, uh, <laughs> Again, this is also my need to step through very quickly for the sake of time, but I'd be happy to talk more about it afterwards, or I guess in the defense would be a good time too. <laughs> what we do is uh, once we have that noise model, um, what we can then do is just basically just subtract it out from our original noisy raw data. And when we pull that out, we basically back out something called a detrended light, uh, de light curve, in this case, a detrended white light curve, and, and this underlying pristine sort of transit model. Uh, which we, you know, to um, our best of our ability, we try to fit uh, by turning a bunch of knobs on this transit model until it fits this data the best. And then um, we essentially just play that same game on a wavelength bin by wavelength bin basis. Once we have this white light curve fit, we keep all those knobs fixed in place, and then we just dial the transit depth knob. And what that means is we get a measurement of these things here called detrended uh, wavelength bend light curves. So it's the same as the white light curve plot, just now instead of trying to fit for all of the possible like sort of white light curve transit parameters, which we'll see more later, everything's fixed except for the wavelength, which varies by color here, and its transit depth, and a few other things, also be happy to talk about later. And so this is great because uh, once we have this, you know, Bob's your uncle, we now have a map between wavelength and transit depth, which is our transmission spectrum. And then from here, also going to breeze through this way too quickly, uh, we're going to run a we've run our file analysis known as a retrieval to model the planet's atmosphere based on this signature. So these are just sort of like the broad strokes, general strokes, sorry, the broad general strokes that we use to um, build out a transmission spectrum and to analyze it. Okay, so with that just lightning overview um, out of the way, I would now like to present our results from our survey um, for our three high gravity hot Jupiters which I might just start calling HEHJs just you know, for, for time. So starting with WASP-43b, 
this is a planet about 300 light years away uh, that was discovered back in 2011 by the Wide Angle Search for Planets, or the WASP program. So I'll just leave a few key bits of information uh, up here about this system. But one of the main takeaways um, that I'll mention is that this is the only high gravity hot Jupiter with transmission spectra measurements available in both the IR and the optical, as we saw earlier, uh, with, the, with our access data. Uh, it's also another study, too, but this is really the only target that has both. And this is important for constraining um, atmospheric retrieval models. Now, also maybe a, a not so fun fact, uh, I think maybe some of you might have solved this already, uh, is that when I took this um, sort of like a screen, a snapshot of the night sky using the software here, it actually tracks the night sky in real time. So it actually captured this starlight, this Starlink satellite right here, and another dimmer one back here actually that drifted into the field of view while I was taking this. And then another three actually came whizzing by um, before I had time to put this figure in the slide. Um, I think maybe a more fun fact, though, is that this target was 43B, and I hope that shows up OK on the projector, is right above this Hydra constellation, which actually happens to be the name of the supercomputing cluster that I know I used to analyze this target. So it's kind of fun to see that coming together there. And then what do we find with this analysis? <sighs> My notes are telling me to slow down so we can take a breath. What do we find with this analysis? We found um, that after combining our optical transmission spectra shown here in blue, mouse <laughs> in blue, uh, with Laura's IR data in the orange, that we're able to confirm um, the presence of water features um, with our retrievals. Um, we also find that any potential features in the optical are most likely just coming from stellar activity as opposed to any particular atomic or molecular features present in the planet's atmosphere. So that takes us to our next target, HAPI 23b. Uh, which was discovered by the ground-based program HATMAT back in 2010, uh, lying right above the Capricornus constellation, just to get you oriented, and Aquarius, which is down here off, off screen on the bottom left. And, hey, there's Saturn too. Maybe we should study that next. And uh, unlike boss 43 b this target has no previous transmission spectra data to draw from, um, and it's also our hottest target, clocking in at about 2,000 Kelvin plus uh, for its equilibrium temperature. Um, which is actually sort of right around that uh, temperature range where Peter's Gauss group in that um, plot of, temp of equilibrium temperature versus molecular uh, like water like scale height we saw earlier sort of goes crazy. Actually, have like some extra figures where they see the model and you can see a breakdown right around that range, and that's because they just they and this is what they mentioned as well. They just you know didn't have enough data points in that region, so it's nice that we're able to you know bring another target that they can use for that sort of analysis in the future. Ba -ba and you know, start filling in that gap. And speaking of filling in those gaps, uh, I guess probably talk about <laughs> these measurements here. So based on our measurements, we found sort of tentative evidence for a clear atmosphere with titanium oxide, but due to the sort of like relative precision we were working with and lack of wavelength coverage available, we were unable to constrain whether the potential TIO, and I we put this in big bold letters, potential TIO signatures, signatures we found, originate from the planet itself or from its star. So uh, to address this, we actually uh, made some uh, HST, or Hubble Space Telescope, uh, simulations uh, in a recently submitted proposal. And uh, we chose this telescope because it has coverage in the UV portion of the spectrum, like right around here, um, which shows that it would actually be able to differentiate between those two cases of either coming from the planet uh, here in blue or from the star here in yellow. And you see it sort of blends together here on uh, the optical, which again is just, you know, another point of evidence of why of having wide wavelength coverage for your transmission, spe transmission spectra is so important. So uh, if we uh, take that disclaimer about the tentative TIO detection into account, this planet is particularly exciting, at least in this target for like we studied, because if the case for a clear atmosphere were to be confirmed for this planet, it would sort of provide sort of like the first solid evidence for this predicted trend that we're looking for of high gravity corresponding to clearer skies. All right, so now we come to our last target, WASP-50b, also discovered by the WASP program, um, I think in the same year. And this uh, lives about 6,600, sorry, light years away, floating up the uh, River Eridanus up here towards Orion, here just to orient you again. Now, given the data we were able to collect for this target, um, Unfortunately, we're not able to place any strong constraints on the characterization of its atmosphere uh, just yet. But on the flip side, this ended up being a pretty exciting case study for our survey. So I'm just gonna take a couple slides just to talk about that. So at the time that some of the data were being collected for this target, um, actually I think about a year before I started uh, you know, my, my, PhD, my grad program, 
Um, there's a simultaneous observation going on uh, right next door at the other Twin Magellan Telescope, uh, the CLAY, on the Low Dispersion Survey Spectrograph, or LDSS-3C. And I have to double check this, but I think the C is from Chicago. But no, we have experts in the room, so like, please correct me if I get the, the mythos wrong. So uh, thanks to this, uh, we were essentially got an extra transit for free um, that we were able to combine with our own IMAX data. So it gave us essentially a signal boost. So here on um, the corner, we have three transits that we collected from IMAX. And then we have our sole uh, LDSS-3C observation that actually happened at the same time um, as the night of our second transit on IMAX. And what we saw is that we got pretty great agreement in the white light curve parameters across all the nights. Um, sort of like summarized over here uh, with these different distributions. And basically, this is just a way of comparing different white light curve parameters against each other, all the fun different combinations. And each color just corresponds to a different transit. And what we see is that they all really just fall on top of each other. And I try to get in scales of like sigma. So whenever people say like within one sigma, you don't have to do that math in your head. Uh, blah, blah. And then if we zoom in um, onto just sort of like those two nights uh, that we had that were shared between the instruments, um, we're, Again, we're able to get within about this one sigma or within error bars for all white Likert parameters using our transit model, uh, like uh, virtually. And we have our familiar RP over our star here, um, not squared, uh, for the planet in the star. And it's things like the mid-transit time, the period, stellar density, and so on and so forth. Also happy to talk all about in uh, gory detail and why we care so much about stellar density versus A over our star. That's actually a pretty cool story. Uh, but anyway, 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 sorry, I got to get back on track here. So. Uh, even though we just did not have the signal uh, to probe this planet's atmosphere in detail with our final combined transmission spectrum, uh, which is shown down here on the bottom right, comparing those two instruments, um, we still uh, they still provided valuable evidence uh, for the feasibility of combining multiple instruments um, in the optical, or at least you know, for our survey, and also provided new data in the optical portion of the spectrum um, that can be combined with future observations at other wavelengths uh, in the future in the pursuit of the characterization of these high gravity um, exoplanets. And on the top, it's just sort of like a zoomed out version of all the transits. And the bottom is just focusing on those two. Just you know, we'll put that up there for completeness. <sighs> and this leads me to the final bit of this talk. A uh, quick look at future prospects for studying high gravity um, hot Jupiters. And a quick peek at what is in store for this field of exoplanet characterization uh, as a whole. Uh, so, so far, I've shown you the transmission spectra of three high gravity hot Jupiters. Um, our tentative results provide more evidence towards the claim that higher gravity leads to clearer skies, but observations are still needed to see if this trend is genuine. Uh, to that end, there are many more HGHJs that have already been detected that are just waiting for this sort of follow-up analysis. So if we plot the sample of known high gravity uh, transiting exoplanets as a function of their TSM, or this uh, transmission spectro uh, spectroscopy metric, um, which is essentially a measure of how uh, easy to observe, uh, a particular target is, um, we get about 34 other potential candidates that would be amenable to this sort of um, analysis. And then for comparison, we have our other known targets from um, my study up here. And the relative size of those circles um, will tell you like, how, uh, quote unquote, like, easy it would be for all follow-up studies. So the larger the circle, the better. So uh, looking to um, other planned telescopes, uh, the future is pretty exciting. Um, there is a lot of current uh, and planned next generation missions, so I'm just going to quickly step through a couple of the highlights. And you know, of course, starting with the crowd favorite, JWST. This is a six and a half meter space based telescope that will make observations focused in the IR. Uh, launched this past December, which, by the way, it's so cool to say launched like past tense. JWST has entered its final orbit around L2, and alignment of its mirror is expected to conclude, I think, in early May. Again, we have experts in the room, so please correct me if any of these dates are wrong. Um, and we even have like a nice selfie here um, of its 18 sort of um, segmented mirrors uh, that make up its, its total aperture. And uh, you know, if that six and a half meter number sounds familiar, that's because that's the size of the ground-based telescope that we're using here. So having it up in space is just so fantastic to have. Um, and I think uh, the last I checked, the first science images um, are expected to drop later this summer. So you know, stay tuned. I got the thumbs up. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. <laughs> So much closer to home, uh, we have the Giant Magellan Telescope um, coming up uh, with the spectrograph GCLEF, the GMT Consortium Large uh, Earth Finder. It has Earth in the name, so you know it's going to be good. Um, that has been designed here, actually, uh, at the CFA, and has a base site in Chile that's currently being built. So here's sort of like a quick cartoon, just to give you an idea of like, how large this telescope is going to be. Uh, so <laughs> each of its mirrors, I think it's something like 8.4 uh, meters. And it's got, what, one, two, three, like seven of them. Well, six and then a seventh one in the middle. 
So each of those is already bigger than you know, this ground-based telescope, the body that I was using. And here it is actually to scale um, compared to the, uh, to the GMC, the whole facility. And with this instrument, uh, we're expected to hit about the couple ppm level. Again, please you know, correct me wrong with these estimates. And the six of its seven mirrors, I believe, was actually just finished being cast uh, last year. And operations are slated to begin in 2029. The last plan, uh, ground-based mission that I'd like to uh, bring up today uh, is this uh, extremely large telescope, uh, which is well just uh, extremely, extremely large. Uh, so coming in at around 40 <laughs> meters in aperture, uh, this telescope, and I know this is not like a, it's not like a meme or a joke, this is like a legit like scale we have here, um, is expected to hit the sub part per million level. You know, again, we're starting at 1,000, that's where we're at today. And at that level, it would be capable of not only doing high precision transmission spectro uh, spectroscopic measurements, but maybe also be able to make the first direct images of you know, not only high, high gravity hot Jupiters or regular hot Jupiters, but small rocky planets as well, and begin doing sort of this detailed characterization of their atmospheres. And first light for this beast uh, is targeted for 2027. So uh, moving off the ground, we have uh, GEOPS, the Characterizing Exoplanet Satellite, so, that was launched December 2019, uh, which will be getting, which uh, gets direct measurements uh, and sizes of known exoplanets uh, for follow-up with JWST, um, as we introduced earlier. And then moving on along the timeline, uh, PLATO, the Planetary uh, Transits and Oscillations of Stars satellite, will focus on rocky planets and form the habitable zone of their host star, habitable meaning uh, where we expect no liquid water to exist on these planets. And um, you know, in the name, Oscillations of Stars makes this uh, target, I'm sorry, the satellite particularly exciting because not only will it be studying the uh, exoplanets, but it will also be studying its stars in detail. And um, John Johnson over there in the corner said it best in our exoplanet uh, class, know thy star, know thy planet. And so it's fantastic that we have an instrument like this coming up in 2026. And finally, I'd um, just like to introduce, uh, I'm just cut myself off here for the different future space-based missions, uh, is Ariel, the Atmospheric Remote Sensing Infrared Exoplanet Large Survey. Uh, satellite, and this is scheduled for launch in 2028. And this uh, satellite will sort of target one, at least 1,000 already known uh, exoplanets uh, and to characterize them, which is just going to be an absolute game changer for comparative exoplanetology. You know, again, we're, we're at like a handful, like I think was it like 70-ish now maybe? So we're going to have 1,000 to work with uh, in 2028. And uh, just wanted to know a quick caveat, this Telescope is expected, or it, I guess already is designed, to be smaller than the James Webb, but because it is a dedicated exoplanet satellite, it'll have a much more observing time available, um, as opposed to JWST, which is a more of a general purpose satellite with its observing time slip between the different subfields um, of astronomy. So with all of that said, um, I think this will be a good place for me to just cut myself off. Uh, the future of exoplanet science, though, uh, is looking bright, and I'm just so excited that I got to be a part of it. So I'm just going to end with a summary slide here, and I would be uh, more than happy to take any questions. So, uh, thank you so much again for your time. Oh, this is going to sound... Oh. Yeah, not from... Because that plot kind of looked like maybe they weren't the best yeah. suited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's such a great question. So this is going to sound so cheesy, um, but it's the truth. They chose me. <laughs> <laughs> the first target was 43B. Um, I wasn't even like, aware of the high graphic hot at the time, to be honest. And it wasn't until Happy 23B came around that we were like, oh, wait a second. Like, <laughs> they got pretty high gravity. Let's see if we can go after this. And it was at the time that I was, uh, I was pivoting in my, uh, my thesis project, so I just came at the perfect time. But, but you're absolutely right. There are these other targets, and you got a whole list that I'm happy to share afterwards. <laughs> other targets to go after. They're just waiting for follow-up study. Let's get them. All right. So actually, you know, if I can add to that, because mm -hmm. like it is true, William says that they basically chose him. So <laughs> you know, I'm gonna explain a little bit the bad part of the story. Oh, okay. like, we were like halfway through another project. We basically needed like one more transit for five targets that he was working on when the pandemic hit. 
and they shut down the Magellan telescopes. And you know, for six months, we were like, okay, we have telescope time schedule. We were just waiting, and like transit after transit got canceled and canceled and canceled. So after six months, you know, I said to him, it's like, man, we just need to find something else. So go through the data that we have about the one that we haven't published, and just let's start looking at it. So he gets to Happy 23, right? And he's like, you know, analyzing the data. He's like, you know, I did some stuff here, but Mercedes, I just went through the new Gaia uh, data release, and the radius of the planet is changed by, uh, the radius of the star is changed by a factor of two. And so just like, there's no way that we're going to find any signal here. I'm like, all right, let's just keep looking for it. And so this planet, so this project was just totally random because we realized that we had data that we weren't even thinking about high gravity planets, but we realized that we had a high gravity planet just because the radius of the star had been mismeasured, and we had done all our calculations with the wrong radius. <laughs> and then at that point, we basically started to look, and we were like, Ian, what's 43? So it's also a high gravity planet. Do we have any other planet in the list? And what's 50 was one of them. So, sorry to interrupt, but it's, no, a, that's great. it's a fantastic story, and it saved the day, man. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I'm not done by the finish just yet. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, Francis, I think you have a question. Right? Oh, yeah. I was curious, in your oh, transmission right. spectra, um, hmm. when you get it at the end, what molecular species are you seeing at these high temperatures on these planets? Ooh, I can use my other slides. Thank you for asking. Ooh, can I keep going past? So here's one particular, ooh, cool. Here's one particular plot from Happy 23B, for example. So uh, we use sort of our in-house code called um, exo retrievals, um, which um, as, as opposed to like this other point you probably heard of like Platon or um, doesn't rely on free chemistry. So we can actually like sort of like look for um, individual species. So the radiuses that we look for are sodium K T I L. Uh, and then for was 3 be also water. But here, because we were just in the optical, uh, we just uh, isolated down to here. And then uh, because, um, oh, something I totally breezed past. Um, the thing about uh, high gravity hot Jupiters is that because it's so high gravity, their atmospheres tend to be like really compressed, so really small scale height, really small signals. So we weren't able to get as strong evidence in our retrievals as we were for our lower gravity targets. So we couldn't put as much stock in our retrievals for these individual measurements. Um, as we could for the high gravity targets. So to get around that, we ran a bunch of them and just did a trend, uh, sort of another trend analysis. So each one of these bars at the top is an individual retrieval run. And um, also something happy to talk about more uh, this time is we use um, a nested sampler um, um, to actually like, sample our primary space when we're doing our retrievals uh, called multi-nest, which is fantastic because it returns this thing called Bayesian evidence, which basically tells us you know, how sort of, like, likely a model is and allows us to do model comparison between our different retrievals. So even though any one single like bar isn't enough to um, provide strong evidence for a particular match of a particular species, we can look at it compared to um, another retrieval and see relatively how much more, I guess, quote unquote, likely it might be. And so in this case, for Hacker 23B, when we run it all across and we try it for you know, different uh, combinations of species present in its atmosphere and different atmosphere types, so we have clear, uh, cloud, hazy, and this thing called spot, which just looks at uh, another sort of deviations, and I'm sorry, I'm going way over here. That looks at deviations uh, in the transit spectrum due to activity in the host star. Clear wins out. That yellow bar right there. Oh, so I don't know why I'm pointing. I'm sorry. Use the pointer. Oh, is that why it's called a pointer? It's mind blown. <laughs> this one wins out. So a clear atmosphere contains TIO. So we know, ideally, you know, I mean, I guess six is okay. That's that's all another talk. Um, but higher the better. You know, having like eight or ten would be preferable. But compared to the other bars, it tends to win out. And so that's sort of how we went about, I guess, looking at particular species and saying if we have a tentative detection. So that's my really long, long way of saying thanks so much for asking. <laughs> we just wrote a bunch of retrievals and compare them to find it. Yeah, uh, great talk to you. Uh, great work. Um, I have a question for the same diagram that Caitlin oh, was sure, sure. asking. So along the same lines. I mean, I was I surprised by uh, those two lines, which are very high surface gravity, the blue, dark blue ones. Mm -hmm. What are those? Which ones? Oh, it's not kill. I used to, I used to have the table <laughs> sort of in the back of my well, head. Not here. the numbers, but kind of. Uh, what, what was delta D there in the beginning? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so uh, this is the five scale height um, signal that we're expecting. Uh -huh. okay. So they'll have a tiny, because the surface gravity is. Yeah. Yeah. 
amazingly is high surface gravity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also um, this figure is also pretty variable depending on which stellar uh, and plant parameters, or really more specifically what plan planetary parameters you infer from the stellar parameters, um, which will affect these all these calculations. So I tried to use the um, most recent ones I could find uh, from the uh, like tick V8, so like Kevin like Stasen's uh, like re uh, analysis of the Gaia VR2 data for the stars, and then use that to calculate everything elsewhere consistently. Um, but you know, I don't think we had complete coverage of every known star transiting exoplanet that it has if this follow-up analysis is done. Um, and then I guess you know also the DR3 out there now too, so that'd be probably a good thing to go back and, and see if that changes anything appreciably here. So I tried to just try to keep this as honest as I could, just using the samples that I had. Um, but yeah, this this could actually change, could change a little bit in terms of the sizes. Um, but maybe overall, though, the transition still persists. Yeah, what we're seeing. Okay. I'm there was another question, but I'm going to ask you Are there any exoplanets that are known to have moons? Oh, gosh. <laughs> that thanks for asking that, Miles. Yeah, exomoons. That is a very like hot topic uh, in, uh, in some uh, in some fields, some some sex of astronomy. Uh, so David uh, Singh, uh, Alex Tichy are two names that come to mind. Uh, and um, actually, David, I'm, I'm sorry, did I say David Singh? I'm sorry, David. <laughs> David Kiffin. <laughs> There's so many Davids. I'm Dave Sherman, who too on my committee. <laughs> um, so um, that, I don't even know what that PPA level would be to detect an extra moon. That's got to be like less than, than 100 for sure. Like definitely less than like for, for an Earth analog and a habitable zone uh, uh, planet. So. There's like a lot of um, like hand waving statistics that go on saying, oh, there might be detection yet, but we just need larger telescopes to be able to sort of make that sort of analysis. But they've definitely been inferred, and there have been like some initial hints, but nothing definitive. I don't, I don't think. But uh, the reason that I brought up David Kipping is because he has this YouTube channel called Cool Worlds that goes all into this, like you know, for I have like an hour long I think video on analysis this video on one of their last papers. Um, but yeah, no, nothing firm right now. I don't think. And it's definitely cool to think about. Now let's cover it in the end and we're going to the private part of the meeting.